so from all these tests what are we trying to understand we are trying to understand the subsoil profile we are trying to understand the uh, depth and extent of different strata we are trying to identify the occurrence of different strata and once we Uh, get our hands on the sample we are trying to identify the properties of the different uh, soils in all these different strata isn't it so uh, once we get all this data what are you going to do with all this so you are going to generate a soil investigation report or a site investigation report or a geotechnical report so in that report you will have all the data regarding uh, the subsoil profile and the recommendation the engineering recommendations that you want to make so that is what is comprised in a soil investigation report so it is a final document of subsoil investigation which contains all the information for the designer so based on this site investigation report the designer will design your foundation so that they will uh, you know decide uh, what is the load bearing they will identify what is the load bearing capacity of the soil what is the type of soil what is the depth of extent of that soil what is your superstructure load how wide your foundation should be to transfer that load safely can the soil beneath carry that load safely will the soil settle if this happens will the fluctuations in ground water affect that soil is dewatering required to be done at the site so all these information uh, should be uh, you know provided by the geotechnical engineer based on the soil investigation report so you should if you are looking at a site investigation report you should have a clear idea about all the Uh, subsurface soil profile occurrence extent uh, etc right so a good soil report should have the following it should have an introduction about the site it should have a borehole log i'll show you what is a borehole log uh, it should uh, say what is the method of investigation you have adopted a few uh, investigation methods we already saw yesterday right auger boring shell boring rotary wash percussion etc so what is the method of investigation adopted at the site and once you have collected the soil samples what are the uh, test results for that samples so then analyze you have to analyze those results and you have to give your recommendations right so based on this a geotechnical engineer will design your foundation okay so a bore log or a boring log i have mentioned yesterday you are uh, continuously going to uh, you know dig into the soil or Uh, you are going to make a borehole in the soil and you will identify what is the type of soil under the ground what is the extent of the soil in the ground and at what uh, depth you will identify your uh, hard rock strata etc so all these data should be uh, entered into a bore log that that should be made into in the form of a record so that record is called a bore log or a boring log so it is a continuous record of different strata identified at different depths right and also in a boring log you should also show the site plan showing the disposition of uh, boring locations so sometimes a subsurface profile is also made based on the bore log data so this uh, on your screen you can see a sample boring log so you can see here the uh, date is there bore number is there company name surface elevation depth site name location of the site who logged it Uh, starting time finishing time who is the contractor equipment type what is the equipment they have used uh, sample hammer torque condition site conditions uh, comments about the site sampling methods all this data will be there then the most important part this is the bore log so this is your graphical bore log okay so here you can see so this is the on top this is your ground surface so top depth 0.0 right so from 0.0 to 1.1 meter so this much depth is 1.1 meter so till 1.1 meter you had top soil okay so the top soil sample was not collected we don't need it 1.1 feet only very small thickness and top soil we are not collecting the sample because not we are not going to rest our foundation on the top soil all right so from 1.1 meters to 2.6 meters what soil do we have here this one we have brown silt rooted weathered and moist right so this soil sample has been collected and it has been assigned sample number 001 and how did they sample the soil they used the split spoon sampler i'll show you a split spoon sampler and how sampling is done all right then you have penetration type and rate okay so here it is mentioned n is equal to 10 so n is the 
uh, SPT number. I'll show you what is an SPT. SPT is standard penetration test. So for that standard penetration test, how many number of blows was required for penetrating to a particular depth that is represented by the N number. OK, so penetration rate, it was N is equal to 10. OK, and uh, using a split spoon sampler, the sample was collected from this particular depth. OK. So, so any any other remarks so they have in, mentioned the remarks so from uh, from uh, 3.7 meters to 4.8 meters you have the next soil they have represented it with a different symbol right you have another soil from 3.7 to 4.8 so that also material description this is what you observe okay this is based on the observation at the site so it is a brown silty clay trace pebbles and it is moist okay two samples were collected Sample number two and three again split spoon sample method uh, n numbers are noted down. Similarly, next next strata you can see it is a pretty deep strata. It is 8.5 meters uh, uh, until 8.5 meters and the thickness is 13.9 meters sorry feet and it is gray weathered shale argillaceous material. So samples were collected sampling method it is cutting. Okay, it is not split spoon sampler. I'll show you cutting. Okay, and penetration type. Can you see it is rotary drilling, right? Rotary drilling we saw yesterday. Correct. And another remarks water was there in the hole. So like this, you will make a complete list of the subsoil uh, strata and its depth of occurrence. It, its extent occurrence and its extent will be marked graphically like this. Okay, and here finally at 39.5 meters, and until 2.6 meters they have continued the excavation so it was found that at, at that level you have gray under clay all right so maybe uh, this here the total uh, thickness and depth until which they have conducted this is about uh, about 40 meters right maybe this depth was enough for that particular foundation for maybe a single story structure or a two or three story structure but if it is a very, uh, you know, a very heavy structure, you might have to go for a uh, boring until you reach your hard rock strata. So till the hard rock strata, you will continuously make this log of what all are the type, different types of soil available at the site. OK, so this is a detailed boring log. OK, this is very important. This carries about 20 marks in your semester. I think I have mentioned in your eva initial evaluation pattern that you will have to develop a geotechnical uh, report and recommendation. So this is one very important parameter for that. OK, we will discuss that later. OK, so keep this in mind. So this is a sample boring log. And this one shows the borehole locations. As you can see here, these symbols test borings. These are all the this is the uh, site plan. OK, this is the site plan. So in the site plan, you will mark the boring locations as you can see here you will mark all the boring locations then cone penetration test that is another type of say, penetration test so locations where cone penetration test was carried out is also marked okay and another one these are also borings borings done by uh, parik consultant someone else have done those borings so that locations are also marked okay so this is a map showing the location of boreholes in the site Right. You can see the north arrow and all. Okay, So this is the site disposition and where all the moorings has been done. So this is also a important uh, uh, input in the geotechnical report or site investigation report. So different types of soil samples that are collected from a site. We had uh, discussed it uh, here and there earlier. So uh, you all know what are the two types of samples that can be collected from the site. So one is a disturbed sample and the other one is a undisturbed sample, right? So in disturbed samples, we have two samples. One is a representative sample and another one is a non-representative sample. So we all know what these are undisturbed samples. What are undisturbed samples? So a sample which retains as closely as possible the true in situ characteristics of the soil and the moisture content, right? The so soil sample which is as closely representative of the site sample soil condition that is called a undisturbed sample all right this undisturbed sample is going to represent your site condition uh, most uh, practically or most uh, closely as closely as possible in the lab okay so that's a undisturbed sample so this samples are required for shear strength permeability and consolidation tests 
right? These three parameters you can see these are the engineering properties of the soil. So they require undisturbed samples, right? So if you want to identify the shear strength, permeability and consolidation properties of soil at a site, you have to collect undisturbed samples, all right? So what can we use disturbed samples for? You can't use disturbed samples for a permeability or consolidation test, right? Because it will already be or shear strength test because it already will be a very much disturbed. The soil structure will be altered. The moisture content will be altered. It might have mixed up with different uh, strata or different types of soils, etc. Isn't it? So what can you use a disturbed sample for? Let's see. So disturbed sample, there are two types of disturbed sample. So in the disturbed sample, it's a type of sample in which the soil structure is significantly or completely disturbed and the moisture content also may differ from its in-situ value. So there are two types of disturbed samples. One is a representative sample and a non-representative sample. So if you can, uh, if it is possible with some suitable precautions, you can retrieve a disturbed sample from the site, but still you can make sure that the natural moisture content and the proportion of mineral constituents are kind of retained or preserved. So those types of samples are called representative samples. You will make sure that it doesn't mix up with different layers of soil or it doesn't you know, mix up with the uh, groundwater, etc. So you will uh, try to uh, retain the natural moisture content and mineral constituent uh, proportion as closely as possible. So, but still uh, the soil uh, will be uh, disturbed and it's um, uh, you know, soil structure or arrangement will be significantly or completely disturbed, but still you can identify its natural moisture content and mineral constituents from that sample. So those samples are called representative samples, even though they are disturbed. It's representative of a particular strata, right? But uh, some uh, soil when you're collecting, it, it will be, you know, your, all, your complete uh, structure of the soil will be altered. It might get mixed up with soil from different layers. So the mineral constituents are also altered. So such samples are called non-representative samples, which are of no use, right? So we have disturbed samples and undisturbed samples, and we have representative and non-representative samples in disturbed samples. Hope this is clear. So these disturbed samples are required for identification and classification tests. What are those tests? Sieve test, particle size distribution curve, then what are the uh, other tests you need? Liquid limit and plasticity intake. So for Atterberg limit test, soil identification, etc., we can use disturbed samples. All right. So next topic is soil sampling, how we are up obtaining samples from the site. So soil sample is nothing but the process of obtaining samples from the site at uh, desired depth and desired location, uh, which is used for assessing the engineering properties. So uh, we have different types of samples. We have block samples. We have uh, tube samples. All right. So block samples are obtained from the pits and tube samples are obtained from boreholes. So uh, the devices used for obtaining the samples are called soil samplers. OK, so I'll show you a block sample here. You can see a block sample which can be obtained from a pit. So block samples like this, you can see here this hatched portion is my sample. So what I will have, I'll have a wooden box like this. So inside the wooden box, I will uh, fill some uh, sawdust. OK, and I will collect a, a sample from the site. Then I will coat it with paraffin wax so that the natural moisture content is not disturbed. OK, I will coat the whole sample with paraffin wax and then I will place it carefully within a uh, wooden box which is filled with sawdust so that the moisture content is also preserved and the sample doesn't shake much. All right, its uh, constituents or particle arrangement is not disturbed much. So this is a block sample. Then I will close it. I will fill it with sawdust. Then I will close it carefully. Then I will write the sample number, location, details, everything on the box. I will send this to the lab. So once it reaches the lab, they will retrieve the sample, uh, do different tests on it. All right. Similarly, you will also have a tube sample like this. OK, a small cylindrical tube. So inside that, again, you will collect the sample. Then uh, you will uh, coat it with paraffin uh, wax on both sides. Then again, you will fill sawdust on both the sides. Then you will put it inside a container. You will have the lid. OK, so there are two types of samples, block samples and tube samples. Block samples are obtained from pits and block samples are generally obtained from boreholes. OK. So we will have a very quick test. So you have to guess what types of soil samples are required for the following lab tests. OK, so soil samples are 
disturbed and undisturbed, representative and non-representative, right? So you have to tell me which one is needed for which particular test, okay? So different types of tests, let's see. Natural water content, what type of sample do you need? Undisturbed or SPT sample? Density of the soil? Undisturbed. undisturbed. Specific gravity? Representative or undisturbed? Grain size distribution? Undisturbed or representative? Atterberg limits? Representative or undisturbed? Coefficient of permeability? Undisturbed only. Then consolidation, undisturbed only. Then shear strength, undisturbed only. So there are different types of soil samplers. So we are talking about uh, uh, thick walled and thin walled samplers. So depending upon, we have two types of tubes, tube samplers, okay? Uh, one is a thick walled sampler and another one is a thin walled sampler and depending upon the mode of operation we have three types one is an open drive sampler stationary piston sampler and a rotary sampler okay so open drive sampler it's a split spoon sampler which can be driven into the soil another one is a stationary piston sampler which will be slowly driven continuously into the soil without impact then the next one is the uh, rotary sample sampler which will be rotated and cut into the soil all right basic three types basic three modes of operation so you have two types of samplers one is a thick walled and a thin walled sampler so first let us see the open drive sampler or the split spoon sampler i'll show you a photo first so you will you know you can see this is a split spoon sampler i showed you this figure yesterday already right so this is a split spoon sampler at one edge you have a sharp edge or a cutting edge so this is closed this looks like a pipe, all right? This is driven directly, it's driven into the soil and it is retrieved so that you will find a sample inside like this. So this sample, this you will close this again, then or you will either close this or put this in a wooden box like this, as you can see here, you see this? Then you uh, pack this very carefully and you will send it off to the lab for further tests. You can see here, you can see this different samples collected from different depths. Depths are marked here. Can you see this? At 7.5 meters, 8.5 meters, 10 meters, 11.5, 13, 19.5, 16 meters. These are the samples collected at different depths as you can see here. All right. So these samples or this sampler is called a open drive sampler or a split spoon sampler. Okay. It's very important. So this is a split spoon sampler, the cross section of a split spoon sampler. So you can see the different parts here. So here you have a cutting edge. You can see a sharp edge. All right. This is the cutting edge. All right. So then we have the cylindrical shaft or the sheath. Here you can see the threads. So these threads, it will be connected to the bottom of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, drill road. Okay. You will have a drill road. Uh, do you remember the figures of wash boring, rotary drilling, etc.? So at the bottom of the drill road, you will remove the churn bit or the cutting edge and you will connect this. Okay. At the bottom of the drill road, you will screw this on instead of the churn bit or the cutting edge. So you will fill, fix this. Then you will drive this into the soil so that the soil enters this. And here you can see there are vents. There are four vents on four sides. Okay, there are vents here for removal of air and excess water. Okay, so this you will drive it into the soil and the sample will be collected inside. Okay, so it is a seamless open end steel tube. So this can be thick walled or thin walled. Okay, so as I mentioned, this thread it will be connected to the tip of the drill rod and it will be driven down at the bottom of the borehole. Okay, so you will use a churn bit or a, a cutting edge to make a borehole. Then you will remove the churn bit or cutting edge and you will fix this split spoon sampler. Once this is fixed, then you will drive this into the soil. Okay, this is driven into the soil. So once you retrieve the sample, uh, it will be uh, sealed. Both the top and bottom will be sealed with grease or molten wax, paraffin wax after extracting. So a uh, thick walled 
uh, split spoon samplers the, if it is thick walled uh, it, thick walled samplers are used for obtaining disturbed samples but representatives by you know uh, the walls will be pretty thick uh, and uh, uh, this will be driven into the soil by repeated blows of a falling weight okay you will uh, keep this on the uh, at the bottom of the borehole and uh, using the drill rod some uh, you know you will apply the impact using dropping weights and this is driven into the ground and you the samples that you obtain will be uh, disturbed samples but it will be representative samples right you will obtain representative disturbed samples and uh, you can also use thin walled samplers so thin walled samples are used of anti corrosion materials like brass aluminum etc which is having suitable strength so that it doesn't break or bend during the uh, insertion and extraction so this is uh, pushed in with a constant rapid motion without impact or twisting if it is thin walled okay because you, if you are using a thin walled our objective is to obtain a undisturbed sample so if it is a thin walled sampler you will not you know use a dropping weight to drive this into the ground you will just push it into the ground and so that the sample smoothly enters inside this and then this is retrieved okay so you have thick walled and you have thin walled you will use a dropping weight to uh, as an impact to hit and drive this into the soil or you can uh, stationarily you can uh, using a piston you can drive this into the soil as well all right so thick walled and thin walled uh, so uh, you will uh, use this you will remove your churn bit and uh, connect this and collect the samples at a depth of every uh, 0.5 to 2 meters or whenever you find a change in the soil strata okay whenever you detect a change in soil strata you will collect a sample so from different depths you will collect the samples like this and as i have shown earlier for different depths you will collect all these samples uh, at different at change of strata or every two meters you will collect samples all right then another very important uh, part is this air vents okay you can see air and water vents you have these four vents so that it is uh, you know imagine uh, you are driving a uh, water bottle upside down into a bucket of water you cannot drive it down isn't it so no can you drive a water bottle open water bottle upside down directly into the uh, bucket of water no right why because there will be pressure formed inside the bottle right similar concept here so if you are driving it into the soil the soil has to displace this air and it has to take this place right so you have these vents here so that when you are driving this into the ground the air is removed through these vents and the soil sample easily without any disturbance it will slide in okay similar case for excess water in the soil as well excess water in or ground water in the soil as well okay so when you are driving this into uh, the soil the water will be uh, you know gushed out through these vents and the soil sample can easily be accommodated inside so that is why we have this air or water vents okay so this is my split spoon sampler uh, sample collected inside you can see right these are uh, samples collected at different depths different samples collected so the sample that you are collecting you should make sure that the disturbance is minimal right so uh, this uh, sample disturbance is governed by various factors so if you look at the if you look at your split spoon sampler there are a few dimensions that you are you should be available about i mean uh, you should be aware about so this you can see here you have de that is this inner diameter of the cutting edge dw outer diameter of the cutting edge okay then inner diameter of the sampling tube ds and outer diameter of the sampling tube dt okay details and design features of the cutting edge these are the sizes notations for a, a sampler so before that the sample disturbance it is actually governed by different factors one is dimension of the cutting edge as i just showed you now dimensions of the sampling tube dimensions of the cutting edge and sampling tube i just showed you now then characteristics of the non return valve and wall friction all right so characteristics of the valve here i showed you the air valve earlier so characteristics of that valve and uh, wall friction how much friction is developed while you are you know uh, inserting this into the soil all right and uh, the sampler cutting edge and sampler dimensions ds and dt 
and DE and DW. Okay, so uh, some parameters, design features, or parameters for the sampling tube. Uh, you can uh, see there are there are four uh, different parameters. One is an inside clearance, another one is outside clearance. So inside clearance is nothing but DS minus DE. So DS is inner diameter of the sampling tube. DE is inner diameter of the cutting edge. Okay. Sampling tube diameter minus cutting edge diameter by cutting edge diameter into 100 percentage as a percentage. All right, so that is my inside clearance. Then outside clearance DW minus DT. That is outer diameter of the cutting edge and outer diameter of the sampling tube. So DW minus DT by DT represented as a uh, ratio of the uh, outer diameter of the sampling tube. DW minus DT by DT as a percentage. Then I have area ratio that is DW minus D, DW square minus D square by D square into 100. So these three parameters you should be aware of. Okay. What is important? I will tell you. So inside clearance DS minus DE by DE. Outer uh, outside clearance DW minus DT by DT. And area ratio DW square minus D E square by D E square. Okay. These are the few parameters of the cutting edge you should be aware of. And another thing is that the walls of the sampler should be kept smooth and oiled to minimize friction. All right. And non return valve should have a large orifice to allow easy escape of air and water. So what were the parameters that you should be uh, you know, uh, concerned about to uh, reduce the sample disturbance? So one was the dimension of the cutting edge. All right. These dimensions, dimensions of the cutting edge, dimensions of the sampling tube, then characteristics of the non return valve I mentioned here the non return valve should have a large orifice so that water and air is easily escaped and uh, the walls uh, another one was wall friction so walls of the sampler should be kept smooth and oiled to minimize the friction so if there is more friction the sample is going to break and get disturbed again right so it should be greased well greased well so that the friction developed is minimal all right so the CI and CO it should be less than one to three percentage and why because the CI or the inside clearance it allows the elastic expansion of soil while entering the tube and reduces frictional drag as you can see here the inside clearance it is a difference between inner diameter of the sampling tube and inner diameter of the cutting edge all right so this ratio is represented as inside clearance so that should be one to three percentage only. So why you need some inside clearance is because it, as you can see here as the sample enters this tube you should provide some space for elastic expansion of the soil right. So once the sample enters this cutting edge and enters this tube there should be enough clearance for the sample to expand alright so that the frictional drag inside will be minimal alright so that uh, provision should be provided and that is given by the inside clearance okay so you can see it is ds minus de by de so it will provide some clearance inside the inside clearance for the sample to allow it for some elastic expansion and uh, reduce the frictional drag while entering into the tube all right next one is outside clearance dw minus dt so that allows easy withdrawal of the sample from the ground. So once you insert this the sample enters and once you retrieve this, it will be easy for removing the sample. That is why you need the outside clearance. OK, then next one is the most important parameter, the area ratio AR. So it represents the ratio of the displaced volume of soil. It represents the displaced volume of the soil to that of the sample collected area ratio. It represent, represents the ratio of displaced volume of soil to that of the sample that is collected inside. How much volume of soil is displaced while you insert this tube compared to the volume of the sample that is collected inside this. All right. So if the area ratio is less than 10 percentage, then we can say that the sample disturbance is less. OK. And if it is a thick walled sampler, then the area ratio may be as high as 30 percentage. I told you earlier, if it is a thick walled sampler, the sample disturbance will be high, right? So if the area ratio is about uh, 30 percentage for thick walled samples and for thin walled samples, 
samplers it can be as low as 6% to 9% also so an advisable area ratio for uh, collecting an undisturbed sample is that the area ratio should be less than 10% okay so that is the importance of ci co and ar okay next parameter is recovery ratio this is generally uh, used for rock core samples so recovery ratio rr it's equal to l by h where L is the length of sample within the tube and H is the depth of penetration of the sample, sampling tube. So H is depth of penetration. If your uh, tube is, let me say, 0.5 meters, you are inserting, you are penetrating the sampling tube for 0.5 meters. Uh, but the sample that is collected inside is only 0.4 meters. The rest of the sample has broken away. All right. So the length of sample within the tube is 0.4 meters and depth of penetration of the sampling tube is 0.5 meters. So what will be your recovery ratio? It will be 0.4 by 0.5, right? So similarly, for a satisfactory undisturbed sample, the value of RR should be 96 to 98%. This L by H into 100%. All right. So the value of recovery ratio should be 96 to 98% for a satisfactory undisturbed sample. So this is basically used for uh, uh, retrieving rock core samples. Okay. So next comes the field and lab tests. So uh, we know that however carefully you uh, collect samples from the site uh, there are going to be some disturbance to the samples isn't it so you always try to test the samples at the field itself in the field itself so that the sample disturbance is minimal and you can test it in 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 their in situ uh, condition with in situ parameters itself right in its natural undisturbed condition itself and also uh, Collecting undisturbed samples, it's very difficult to obtain samples from non-cohesive granular soils, isn't it? Non-cohesive granular soils, purely sandy soils. It's very difficult to collect a, a sandy soil sample inside a split spoon sampler, isn't it? You insert the sampler, the soil will be filled inside. You remove the sampler, the soil will simply drain out, isn't it? Yes or no? So it is very difficult to collect non-cohesive granular soil samples from the field or undisturbed samples from the field. Uh, so in such cases, it's always advisable to go for field tests. Uh, but however, cohesive soils, generally samples are collected because cohesive soils, clay soils, it's very easy to cut them into different shapes. And, you know, you can use a split spoon sampler. You can get a block sample, chunk sample, anything you can get because you can cut it into different shapes and sizes and they will stay intact when compared to that of a purely sandy soil, isn't it? So usually for non-cohesive granular soils, you will go for field tests. And in the case of cohesive soils, usually you will collect samples. So uh, data from the field test, the, I told you we will do tests in the field itself. So those uh, test results, using those test results, we have so many empirical relationships that can be uh, correlated with the uh, different soil properties or parameters like settlement or shear strength, etc. Right? We have several empirical formulas developed by several researchers in the past. So maybe a, a penetration resistance in the field can be correlated to the shear strength of the soil. Uh, for example, vein shear test we saw, isn't it? Do you remember vein shear test? You measure the torque for driving the vein into the soil and that is related to the shear strength of the soil, right? So th there we saw an empirical relay. There we saw an equation uh, connecting the same, right? So there are different equations like this for uh, different uh, field tests which can be correlated to different soil parameters like shear strength, settlement, etc. So there are several field tests available. So a penetration test, pressure meter test, vein shear test, plate load test, and several geophysical methods are also there. So we will see all these. Okay. Uh, many common penetration tests are that there are three common penetration tests. So there are three types of penetration tests. One is SPT, then DCPT and SCPT. SPT is standard penetration test. DCPT is dynamic corn penetration test and SCPT is standard uh, static corn penetration test. So we have three different penetration tests. So the most commonly used one, very commonly used one is my standard penetration test. So standard penetration tests are carried out in borehole. DCPT and SCPT are used uh, without boreholes. Okay. So what you basically 
do in penetration tests are you will measure the resistance of the soil strata to penetration by a penetrometer and then as I, as I mentioned earlier you have so many empirical correlations between this penetration resistance and the soil property so you will correlate those with those empirical relations and you can uh, deduct some soil parameters okay this is what is done in standard penetration test dcpt and scpt so first one is PT or standard penetration test. So it is used to determine the in-situ parameters of the soil, basically used for cohesionless soils as the correlations are very well established. The empirical, there are many empirical relationships which are very widely accepted by uh, many geotechnical engineers. So usually standard penetration tests are adopted in cohesionless soils. So how the test is done, it's uh, very simple. I'll show you. So note this IS 2131 1981 mentions the specifications for standard penetration test. IS 2131 last revised in 1981. Okay. All right. So let's see this. Yeah. So you can see here you have a borehole of uh, 55 mm to 150 mm. You have different sized boreholes. So uh, basically a borehole ranges from 55 to 150 mm. So let's say we have this borehole. Then at the uh, bottom of the uh, drill road this is my drill road at the bottom of the drill road what do i have i have a split spoon sampler okay i have a split spoon sampler at the bottom then i have an i have a drill road then i have an anvil then i have a guide pipe then i have a weight hammer all right then i have a pulley and winch system then i will pull this so this is raised. I drop this. So this free falls through a height of uh, 750 mm. This hammer is 65 kg in weight. This is 65 kg. And this free fall height is 750 mm, 75 centimeters. So I will raise this to a height of 750 mm. I will drop this. This is a 65 kg hammer. So it will hit this anvil and this split spoon sampler is driven into the ground with each impact. OK, so what you are going to measure here is you will mark 150 mm on the roads, right? You will hit it and how many number of blows using a 65 kg hammer and a free fall height of 750 mm, how many number of blows are required to drive the split spoon sampler to a depth of 150 mm or 15 centimeter? This is what is measured in this test, OK? The number of blows required by a split spoon sampler to be driven into the soil for 150 mm using a hammer of 65 kg falling through a free fall height of 750 mm. That number of blows is represented as the uh, N value or SPT N value, not just for 150 mm. You will do that test for three times. 150, 150, 150, 450 mm in total. And if you get 450 mm penetration, listen very carefully. If you get 450 mm penetration, you will discard the first 150 mm as you will consider that as the seating drive. The rest 150 plus 150, 300 mm penetration. What are the what is the number of blows required for that 300 mm that is designated as the N value for that particular soil at that particular depth. OK, suppose I have made a borehole. Let me say borehole is one meter at the bottom of the borehole. I'll make this borehole at the bottom of the borehole. What will I do? How will I make this borehole? I will at the end of the drill bit. I will have a churn uh, drill or a, a cutting edge. So I will uh, use any of the method wash boring, percussion drilling, rotary drilling, auger boring, any method I will use and I will make a borehole. Let me say this borehole is one meter deep now. So what will uh, happen now? I will remove this. At the end of this drill road, I will connect my split spoon sampler. I showed you it has threads at the end, edge. So I will connect that split spoon sampler. I will keep that split spoon sampler on the uh, surface of the borehole. Then I will raise this and drop it and I will count. OK, I will count. OK, uh, I will raise and drop it. I will count it. And for the first 150 mm uh, penetration, how many number of blows? So let us say n is equal to 10. OK, it took 10 blows to drive it for 150 mm. Then I will keep on going. Another 12 
n uh, uh, another 12 number of blows for the next 150 mm okay next i will again i will continue again another 10 blows for the next 150 mm so i reached 450 mm so the first 10 i will discard so the second uh, number of blows for the uh, second 150 mm and the third 150 mm it was 12 and 10 so my n value at 1 meter depth is how much 22 so that is my spt n value at 1 meter depth of soil all right suppose suppose uh, i didn't reach uh, 450 mm penetration suppose i had a hard rock here itself okay maybe at uh, 1.3 meters i had hard rock okay i am driving this the uh, first 150 mm it went uh, uh, 10 number of blows the first 150 mm then the second uh, 150 mm it took 12 blows and the third 150 mm was not reached how many ever number of blows i gave it couldn't penetrate more than 12 mm let us say 12 cm let us say all right so what i will do is at that depth i will say that at that depth i have reached the refusal and the soil above that the n value is 10 plus 12 the initial 10 plus uh, the next 12 that is my n value at that particular depth and below that i can say that i encountered refusal because for a n value greater than 50 for 150 mm drive or n value greater than 100 for 300 mm drive if it is more than 50 for 150 mm or more than 100 for 300 mm penetration you will say that the you have reached refusal level or hard rock strata maybe right so that level is called as refusal okay either uh, you should uh, go for uh, Uh, more than 50 blows for 150 mm or more than 100 blows for 300 mm or no advancement also you might not be you might not even be able to drive 150 mm so that that's called as no advancement okay you cannot drive the sampler any further so in all these three conditions that is n is greater than 50 for 150 mm n is greater than 100 for 300 mm or no advancement in these three conditions you will say that you have reached refusal level all right hope it is clear all right so this is a testing n value uh, spd test so there need to be some corrections done for n value all right so there are two corrections for the n value one is an overburden pressure correction and the other one is a dilatancy correction so uh, the penetration resistance is actually influenced by overburden pressure so as the self weight of the soil increases the self weight of the soil increases with depth isn't it right because the overburden pressure at uh, let's say a depth of h meters is gamma into h isn't it gamma is the density of the soil so gamma into h correct for 2 meters it is gamma into 2 for 4 meters it's gamma into 4 so overburden pressure keeps on increasing with depth isn't it so this overburden pressure has a effect on the n value so as the overburden pressure increases the resistance of the soil also increases agree correct confining pressure increases with depth isn't it the pressure with which the soil at a deeper layers are uh, confined it is higher when compared to that at the shallow levels isn't it correct the confining pressure at a deeper uh, level is higher uh, when compared to the confining pressure at a shallow depth do you agree with that yes makes sense so the overburden pressure is high at the base i mean high at uh, higher depths and it is low at the shallow depths so this is going to influence your n value also right so if the confining pressure is higher you might require more number of blows at a deeper depth correct and at shallow depth overburden pressure is very less so the number of blows required in the same soil the number of blows required will be lesser correct so to correct this using this concept so to correct this you will go for a correction of overburden pressure okay so as the confining pressure increases with depth n values at shallow depths are underestimated and n values at the higher depths are overestimated correct so to get a uh, you know uh, corrected n value you have to apply the overburden pressure correction so that equation is given by n dash is equal to cn into n where n dash is the n dash is the corrected corrected spt n value cn is my uh, overburden correction factor and n is the recorded n value okay and that cn was 
uh, equation was given by Peck, Hansen and Thornburn in 1974. So the equation says Cn is equal to 0.77 log 2000 by P, where P is the effective overburden pressure at depth at which N value is measured. How do you measure this overburden pressure? Very simple, gamma into H, isn't it? Effective overburden pressure at depth at which N value is measured. That is my P. Substitute that P here, I will get my Cn. So I get my Cn, I substitute it here, I get my corrected N value, N value corrected for overburden pressure. All right. So that is my correction for overburden pressure. Next comes the correction for dilatancy. What do you mean by dilatancy? Something dilates means it expands, right? Do you remember the behavior of dense sandy soil, the volume change behavior of sandy soil to strains? Initially, the volume decreased very lightly. The volume decreased initially. Then after that, you saw a increase in volume. So uh, you remember the volumetric change behavior, right? So on application of some stresses, uh, as the strain increases, what happens initially, there will be a small reduction in the volume. But after that, what happens as the strain increases, uh, what happens? The volume increased, right? The sample dilated, correct? So same thing, if you are using this test, if you are using SPT test in, um, fine sand or silty dense soil or very dense sand deposits below water table, what happens? The sample is going to dilate when you apply such strains, right? So there should be a correction for that dilatancy as well. So that dilatancy correction is applied when your overburden corrected N value, that is N dash, exceeds 15 for these types of soils. All right. If your overburden corrected N value is greater than 15, then you will have to apply your dilatancy correction. Okay. Only for these three types of soils fine sand, silty dense soil or very dense sand deposit. Okay, so that uh, correction was given by Terzaghi and Peck. So that equation reads N double dash, that is N value corrected for overburden and dilatancy. Okay, N double dash is equal to 15 plus 0.5 into overburden corrected N value, that is N dash minus 15. All right. So if your N, N dash overburden corrected N value is less than 15, then your dilatancy correction is not required. So dilatancy corrected N value is the same as overburden corrected N value. But if your N value is, if your overburden corrected N value is greater than 15 for these three types of soils, then you will have to apply this correction. Clear? Hope this is clear. All right. So we will uh, wind up here.